Yes, so the next speaker will be Phil Simovic, and he will be talking about the relation between quantum black holes and thermodynamics. Okay. Is that loud enough for the, okay? Okay, thank you very much uh, to the organizers especially for having me talk here today. I should try to stay in the yellow. Uh, my name is Phil. I'm a postdoc uh, at Macquarie University. And today I want to tell you about some work that's been done over the past few years with uh, my collaborators at the University of Waterloo and Primer Institute, whose names will show up throughout the talk. Um, but also to, to just talk very broadly about uh, the role that black hole thermodynamics plays in quantum gravity, the types of things that we have learned or can learn from studying black hole thermodynamics as they relate to, to various approaches to quantum gravity. So that's what I hope to accomplish today, and there will be uh, later some focus on uh, especially phase transitions for black hole spacetimes that occur in, in the bulk. Um, so. We have today uh, lots of promising routes for understanding quantum gravity from a phenomenological perspective, tabletop experiments and avenues for probing quantum gravity features from cosmology, but nonetheless black holes remain one of the, the primary tools that we have and, and have used for the longest time in, in understanding uh, especially non-perturbative effects that we expect in quantum gravity. And even at the classical level they reveal many features that we expect from a quantum theory of gravity. And this has to do with their apparent uh, thermodynamic properties. So for ordinary systems, we have thermodynamics, which arises as some coarse graining of some microscopic degrees of freedom. These seem to hold for black holes as well, which are presumably things we can interact with with our own thermodynamic systems. So there must be some clues to these microscopic degrees of freedom contained even at the classical or semi-classical level that you can reveal by studying black hole thermodynamics. So whether or not the objects that we actually see in the sky in our telescopes today are manifestations of those classical solutions of general relativity that we're used to, nonetheless studying them tells us a lot about uh, quantum gravity in, in general. So I want to talk about uh, thermodynamics, so this will be familiar to some, but uh, in the modern treatment, uh, essentially uh, black hole solutions obey a very nice law which resembles the law of thermodynamics here. And it can be seen to arise really from diffeomorphism and variance of Lagrangian theories of gravity. So really in any metric Lagrangian theory of gravity, um, where the Lagrangian is constructed locally from the field and its derivatives, you can imagine you have some, some uh, killing vector xi, some generator of your diffeomorphisms. There's some Hamiltonian that, that probably exists that generates the flow in your phase space that corresponds to that diffeomorphism. And then Hamilton's equations tell you that that variation is just given by some integral over a Cauchy surface of your symplectic current. Now, this holds generally, but if xi is a diffeomorphism and if you specialize to uh, a black hole spacetime, then uh, this is a pure boundary term, this variation vanishes, and you can write it at this, as this integral over the interior boundary, which is like your black hole horizon, and some integrals of these quantities at infinity. Now, in the standard treatment, these are related to the surface gravity of the black hole and the entropy, which is this integral of this another charge two form in, in, 4D, in 4D. Um, and this gives you the standard thermodynamic relation that was already derived in the 70s by just taking variations of the ADM mass in Einstein gravity. But this version holds much more generally for any theory that you want, really. There are some subtleties in the construction and ambiguities in the definition of these, of these forms, but nonetheless, it, it, it holds quite generally. So, so the first lesson is, A, that horizons play uh, a central role in black hole thermodynamics. Whereas the temperature is something uh, that has a little bit of leeway in its definition, people will uh, scoff at the diagram on the left, and you should because this is not really what we think of uh, that quantum gravity will, will predict as a picture for a black hole evaporation. Nonetheless, this is the kind of picture that you would draw. You have an event horizon, and the temperature observed near scry plus is, is related to the surface gravity of the black hole. But for the temperature, it's really not about the horizon, it's about uh, the exponential redshift of the modes that come in with the collapsing matter. 
And this exponential relationship between the null generators at scry plus and scry minus is really all that you need to have a Hawking temperature, um, and because this is the quantity that enters when you compute your, your bugly above coefficients. So, so the temperature really doesn't have to do so much with horizons, um, and it exists in some approximate sense in uh, space times even where an event horizon never forms. But um, the entropy really does tell us something about the horizon, about boundaries. It suggests that really gravity admits this holographic interpretation. We've heard about this this morning, and I'll, and I'll cover some of the things that were said there as well, very briefly. Um, but that's one of the main lessons. Gravity appears to be fundamentally holographic, and, and that really comes to light in the case of black hole entropy, which cannot be removed from the existence of that horizon. So I'm um, going to talk about phase transitions and what we can learn from those. And most of the studies of black hole thermodynamics take place in anti de Sitter space. We heard this morning it has some very nice properties near the boundary that allow you to define an ensemble where a black hole is in equilibrium with its own radiation if it's large enough. So there is some uh, natural length scale in ADS that separates a, a Minkowski-like region and uh, an ADS region. This is Euclidean ADS, but nonetheless, a small black hole will act as if it's in flat space and just evaporate. The thermal state, the, the hot graviton state, dominates the statistical ensemble. But if the black hole is large enough, then it can come into equilibrium with its own radiation, which is reflected from the conformal boundary of ADS. And that's really just to do with the fact that the equilibrium temperature of the ensemble is not a monotonic function of the horizon size as it is in, in empty space, or flat space, rather. So this is most salient in the Hawking page transition. It's easily seen by just computing the free energy using the ADM mass, the Hawking temperature, the entropy. And as you increase the equilibrium temperature of the spacetime, you know, uh, for small temperatures, the radiation phase or this hot graviton phase, whatever you want to call it, uh, dominates the ensemble. But at some critical temperature, there is a first order phase transition to a large black hole. There is also a small black hole branch. This one has a negative specific heat. This one is not thermodynamically stable, but this large black hole branch is. And this Hawking page phase transition has uh, important implications, uh, applications in ADS CFT, because it's seen to be dual to these deconfinement transitions in, in various CFTs. And that's been studied extensively over the past uh, 20, 30 years. So what we, what we started to do was look at um, just more complicated space times, things with more global charges and so on, with a variable cosmological constant, and try to understand what kind of structures emerge, what kinds of new bulk phase structure we can find that is interesting. Um, there's a nice review by Rob Mann and his collaborators, and we looked at these Reissner Nordstrom ADS black holes uh, some years ago. And, and there, if you're in an ensemble where the, the charge is fixed, you, you can't have a Hawking page transition anymore because uh, if Q is fixed, then M can't go to zero. So instead what you have is the, uh, the size of the black hole increases along the, the direction of the arrows, so you have a small to large black hole phase transition, much like the Hawking page phase transition, first order. Um, if you have a variable ADS length scale, you can consider an ensemble where this is the extended phase space where lambda is variable. Uh, this will terminate at a second order phase transition for a given value of lambda. Um, and you can draw the coexistence curve for these black hole solutions here. Um, and they terminate at a critical point separating the small and the large black hole phase. And this has some remarkable uh, similarities to what happens in ordinary fluid systems. Uh, Van der Waals fluids, the liquid to gas transition. In fact, you can compute critical exponents near uh, the critical point and find that they are exactly equal to uh, the values predicted by mean field theory. So there's been extensive study of that in many different cases uh, by lots of different groups, not just us. One thing we looked at uh, a few years later was gauss binet corrections. Okay, so leading corrections from some, in a, some effective field theory description of gravity in the bulk. Um, and you start to see even more exotic phase transitions, re-entrant phase transitions, we call them, where you're on this small black hole branch, you jump to an intermediate one, and then back down to a large black hole. A triple point where three stable phases meet and exist at the same equilibrium temperature, they contribute equally to the partition function there. 
So those are just some things that we've seen over the years. Now, with an eye for applications to uh, cosmological spacetimes, flat space holography, to sitter holography, um, we started to think about how to apply these techniques to uh, to sitter and asymptotically flat black holes. So it's a lot more difficult there because you don't have these nice properties of ADS. Um, a black hole will just radiate, and especially even in de Sitter, it's even harder because you have two horizons with an independent temperature. There's a heat flux between the two horizons. The system is not really in equilibrium. Um, you can't define the asymptotic mass. You don't have a globally time-like killing vector field. And so uh, there's a few different ways to approach it, but the most promising is one where you just fix the data on a finite radius outside of the black hole. It's effectively putting it in a cavity, and the cavity uh, represents the external environment of the black hole. And this is something that was done using a Euclidean path integral, originally by Gibbons and Hawking in the 70s, uh, elaborated on by York and Whiting, and uh, more recently, uh, Steve Carlip uh, and Vaidya um, presented a more modern treatment uh, studying asymptotically flat and disorder black holes using this kind of technique, which we've since uh, taken and extended to all kinds of different uh, scenarios. So the basic idea is to take the thermal partition function and in the standard way approximate it. Well, it's some path integral that you can't do. So you approximate it in a saddle point approximation. Uh, you just take the dominant contribution to be the classical metrics which solve the equations of motion. And you assume that this can be done properly. Um, this should be really the reduced action here. We work in spherical symmetry, there's a spherical reduction, and you work in this constraint subspace where you impose the equations of motion, you take this reduced action, and you can readily compute the mean thermal energy of the ensemble, the entropy, the free energy, and so on. And because you fix the temperature at the boundary, this really does represent an equilibrium situation, and you expect the first law to apply neatly there. Uh, you see all kinds of new and interesting type of phase structure in the bulk when you do this. Uh, I just give one example here because I don't have much time. Um, that coexistence line that I showed before is now bounded in pressure um, at the top and the bottom. Uh, so it exists in just some compact region of your thermodynamic parameter space where ordinarily uh, it's only bounded at one end. I should note that you have to be very careful about what it actually means when you do that Euclidean path integral, that saddle point approximation. Uh, recently, Ted Jacobson and collaborators have elaborated on how you actually get to this saddle point approximation properly and how it can be done um, from the full path integral. And I think somebody will talk about that a little bit later today. Um, so there are some caveats. Nonetheless, all the kinds of phenomena that you see in de Sitter with this cavity approach have analogs in anti de Sitter where you don't need to use a Euclidean path integral at all. So we expect these kinds of features to be robust predictions um, if, uh, if not you know, precise numerical values that, that might change. So let me quickly talk about some kinds of things you can study uh, through ADS CFT. And, um, you know, there's various theories that can exist on the boundary that could be dual to the bulk. Um, I'll just highlight some interesting features. I mentioned that we consider an extended phase space where you vary lambda, you allow it to vary, and you can see that lambda will actually, a variation of lambda corresponds to obviously a variation of the ADS length scale, and therefore a variation in the number of colors of the boundary CFT. Now this is a little bit concerning if you're motivated by ADS CFT because now you're moving through theory space. So uh, what you can do instead is fix n, uh, but then you have to vary g in the bulk. Um, so there are some subtleties associated with the extended phase space formulation as far as the bulk to boundary map, but you don't have to work in that uh, extended phase space. You can just do things with constant lambda if you like. Um, corrections in the bulk, we have found, have implications for the boundary theory, which is a strong coupling. So you can study some interesting things that uh, reveal certain features of the boundary theories that you ordinarily might not have access to. One example, uh, it, it's generally, so, so if you have an interacting quantum field theory in some IR limit, you can reasonably describe it with hydrodynamics. 
And for a very large class of, of such conformal field theories, the ratio of the viscosity of the fluid to the entropy density is a universal value 1 over 4 pi. Um, so this divided by the entropy density. And corrections from the large n expansion only increase this value, so this is predicted to be a universal lower bound for this ratio for basically all fluid materials. If you add a Gauss-Binet correction uh, to the bulk, then it actually lowers this universal lower bound in the boundary theory, uh, and you see that it's actually less than 1 over 4 pi. So by studying these kinds of uh, corrections in the bulk, we can learn things about the boundary CFT. So here are some examples that we studied over the years. Um, scalar fields with conformal coupling, 4D, Gauss-Binet, Lovelock gravity, uh, more recently regular black holes, and um, you can look at the papers there uh, to find the details of that uh, construction. So I close with, instead of uh, avenues for future research, maybe uh, questions for the discussion, things to think about, um, black hole thermodynamics is not a uh, solution to quantum gravity, it's not an answer, but it, it poses the questions that you need to answer. So um, where do the microscopic degrees of freedom live? Are they on the boundary of the black hole in infinity? What about information loss? Unitarity. Do we believe in boundary unitarity? ADS CFT will tell you yes, other people will tell you no. There are arguments both ways. And what can you do in a local or quasi-local hol holographic setting? And how can you translate these results from this cavity approach to these notions of local holography. Those are some things uh, that I would like to address in future work and discuss with whoever is willing. So thank you to the organizers. And thank you. Yes, sir. We do have time for one quick question for Phil. Sorry for, uh, for making you run again. <laughs> um, so about this, these phase transitions of uh, black holes in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in anti -de -sitter. Um If I remember correctly, usually these, these uh, uh, heat capacity calculations, they don't really take into account the back reaction of the uh, thermal equilibrium state of the quantum field onto the space-time as a whole, because this is, uh, does not have zero energy, of course. This right. Field. So, does have you taken this into account here in these calculations? Or? So, so yeah. If you're if you're very concerned about uh, stability past this uh, first order approximation, then you need to consider back reaction and, and do things like this. Um, just to leading order, we we just compute the thermodynamic heat capacity and ignore back reaction. Um, in, it, you ignore back reaction even when you compute this Hawking flux, so it would be a little bit inconsistent to start including back reaction effects in the one sense, but, but not in the other. But it can so it that's essentially effectively change your, uh, your, the radius of your, uh, of your anti-de-sitter space. Uh, it, could do, it can do that, and it can also make an ensemble which is otherwise uh, stable, uh, suddenly not stable. Nonetheless, even those unstable phases, um, you know, they correspond to string stars in ADS. Uh, and different unstable phases, but phases that you can still realize. I mean, in a, even in an ordinary fluid, you can have a superheated fluid, and it's unstable, but it, it's still physical. Okay. Right, so. Thank you. Okay, I think we should move on, but there's, of course, then discussion time. So let's thank uh, Phil again.